for our text today, let's go back to that gospel reading, that prayer of Jesus for you and for me, for all believers. He said to his father, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Have I told you lately that I loved you? Forgive me if it hasn't sounded that way, but actually, in our call to confession today, you may have noticed from the hymnal, I changed the words a little bit. Instead of saying, Beloved in the Lord, I say, Dear loved ones. That's my way of saying, You're dear to me, and you are loved by me. But I don't say, My dear loved ones, because then it might sound like I was the source of the love. Oh no, it's much bigger than me. The love, the source of the love that comes to us is God who is love. And what does it mean that God is love? Well, stop and think about it for a moment. We're going to talk next week about Trinity Sunday, and I mentioned that triangle today to the little ones. God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, the three persons in one, is love. And that love for the persons is so perfect and so full and so free that God wanted more to love. So what did he do? He made a beautiful, perfect universe. And in that universe, he put a man and woman made in his own image that he could love. And oh, how he loved Adam and Eve. He would walk with them in the garden in the cool of the day, listen to them and teach them and console them and, and pour his love on them in every way possible. And what did man do? What did that first man and his wife do? They rejected him. They listened to Satan lies that they could be like God, that they could be able to make up their own minds and, and do a better job. They rejected the perfect and pure love of God. But here is how great God's love is. When they rejected him, when they turned their backs and despised him, he didn't stop loving them. He didn't punish them. He didn't cast them away. He destroy them forever. No, God revealed that he knew he'd do that. They would do that. And even before the creation of the universe, Jesus, the Son, and the Father had said, in love, we are going to rescue these fallen people. In love, the most amazing gift will be given of all. The innocent will die for the guilty. The one offended, the one hurt, or sinned against would take the punishment and the penalty of the one who had done wrong. That's exactly what happened when, in perfect agreement, the Father sent the Son who willingly went, came and took flesh, took a body upon himself. The eternal one limited to just a few cells like us. A few cells that grew and became a man who kept God's law perfectly. And then wonder of wonders carried on his shoulders with that cross all of our guilt and shame. All of the condemnation that we deserve for what? Oh, the list is shameful. What are we like? We're selfish, greedy, idolatrous, unforgiving. We're mean toward others. <clears throat> we're violent. We're hurtful. We're hateful. It's people who invented all those sins, not God. And yet Christ said, Father, for all of those sins, for all the punishment those things deserve, let me die. Let me take their curse and their punishment. And Father, forgive them. Make them ours. Wash them and clean them with my blood. Make them holy in your sight. And wash them and adopt them in baptism. And make them your children. That, my friends, is the deepest love. Deeper even than love for a friend. Christ died for us while we were yet his enemies. While we were crying, crucify him. He was saying, Father, forgive all the people of the world, for I bear all their guilt. <coughs> and how do we know that the Father accepted that loving request? Why, Jesus rose from the grave. The Father raised him intact. He raised him glorified 
and then ascended him into heaven that Christ might rule with him out of our sight but still in our presence still dwelling within us for that's the next amazing thing about God God's not someone who loves us from afar across the street or across the universe Christ in us the hope of glory is the scriptures way of putting it Jesus Christ ascended so he could come back into each one of us all at the same time what this means is into you and I when God claims us when the Spirit works faith through the word into you and me comes Christ your loving Savior your Lord and God the one who defeated death for you the one that will raise your body so you'll live forever in those perfect halls of heaven where that river of water of life perfect and pure comes and the food never ends and the celebration for his goodness never ends we glorify God when we praise him and thank him for that and when we worship him and sing hymns but that's not the only thing that glorifies God. Jesus said, Father, let our glory be in the, the glory of unity. For it was marvelous that the Father and the Son and the Spirit together brought about our salvation. But it's also marvelous that God brings you and me together. What does Jesus do? He puts in us not just a love for God, who we can't see, but he gives us a love for each other. Look around for a minute. Go ahead. Look at each other. These are people that all matter to God. And because they matter to God, you and I matter to each other. We love because he first loved us. We value each other and cherish each other and say, you are as dear to God as I am. And because you're dear to God, you're dear to me. That's why we share our prayers when someone's lost a job or lost a loved one we pray together we give a comforting hug we give our friendly handshakes we say hello in the store or on the walking paths we lift each other up when we're sad we rejoice with the gift of, of new life of babies and, and marriages and things and when things fall apart and things aren't so good we come along as each other and try to lift each other up with the knowledge that Christ is still the victor and he still has us in his hands. And this unity is why we're a congregation in this place. And it's why the church around the world is one body, one in Christ, so that you and I are connected to those Christians in Mozambique and in China and in Russia and in South America. We are all part of the body of Christ. We are connected. And that's why we help. Oh, we bring stuff for Sunday school kids and, and, and vacation Bible school supplies. But we also love those that aren't even part of our church yet. The ones God is still calling. That's why we do the food pantry. That's why we have an offering to help the people that are affected by the floods. Donate the clothes we don't need donate the money that can be used to help fix their problems that's what people do who love they give they serve because God has first loved us that's what draws us together in the unity of the Lord his love poured into us flowing out through us to each other that's a miracle that you and I from so many different backgrounds care about each other worship with each other believe in the same God together and actually show it. It's a glorious thing when the church of God lives in that love and lives in it so that others see it and are drawn to saying, I want that. I want a, I want a peace. I want a joy. I want to be loved forever by the God who makes those people so loving. That is God's plan for us. That is his desire for us. And that is what he brings about as we hear his word and put it into practice. We then glorify the Lord and more are drawn to him. God grant that it be so. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.